Hi, I'm Grandma, and this is the Coordinates Game. So in order to uh, understand the game, let me walk you around this layout. Basically, um, if we think of the cyan block as the origin, then the, this is the x-axis, or of course it's the x-axis is pointing east, this is the, this axis is the sat pointing south. So that would be to the, in front of me, if in front of me is east, then to my right is south. And of course that is north and behind me would be west. The little blocks, the little white blocks at the end of the grid are there to help you understand where the axis is. And of course the origin is at the center. So all the coordinates here are relative to the origin. So like for example, this block right in front of the origin would be one zero. So it'd be one to the north and zero to the, I'm sorry, one to the east and zero to the south. Of course, um, east is also called x and south is also called z. So these coordinates that we're seeing here, two minus three would be two from origin and minus three there. So if I, I broke it and it turns green, that means I got it correct. And so let's do another one. So we go three blocks to the north or three blocks. Well, I keep doing that. It's so built in. I'm so old. I always thought that up was north. Okay, east and that go three blocks on X and minus four on, oh, I missed it, oh gee. So that would have been one, two, three, and then yes, minus four. So if it turns red, that means I missed, got that one wrong, okay. Well, let's do another one, uh, one, zero. Well, one to the east and zero, which would mean we're right on the axis. There it is, I got that one correct. Okay, let's start a new game. And we do that by, of course the object of the game is to get all of these um, blocks filled up with green. Uh, of course I have yet to do that, I end up with a few red ones no matter what I try to do. So we're gonna do a, and we say run. So that will start a new game. See, we have a new grid, and look, it's telling us, thank goodness, x, the coordinate is x, z, or e, and s. They mean the same thing. So remember that. So now, my first point is minus four. Of course, we know that's five. We know this is minus five, so that would be minus four. Uh-oh, got that one wrong. I hit the block too soon, so okay, let's try minus four, three. One, two, three. Wow, got that one right. I'm gonna do minus two, which means we're two blocks to the west, or minus x, and we're five blocks all the way over here. Yep, got that one right. Okay, five to the east and zero on z. Okay, three minus one. That's pretty good. Okay, we could keep on playing. It takes a while. Oh, that's the easy one. Let's go ahead and do that one. That's five and five is way up here in this positive corner. There it is. And then minus five, five. Can you believe it? 
So that would mean we're going to go down here to minus 5 and over here to 5. Yep, that was it. And minus 2, minus 3. So that would be minus 2. Oh, I know why I'm, I forgot to put my glasses on. I'm having a little trouble figuring out exactly where the square is. Okay, let's try that once more. Another one, minus three, four. One, two, three. Got that one, yay. Minus two and one. Got it. Okay, we've got the hang of it now. Minus five, that would be there, and one. Okay. Now this game would really, will really help you learn how Minecraft thinks about coordinates. So um, we won't go into how you use coordinates in Minecraft, but what you're learning here is exactly how you use it. For example, if you think of this origin as you could use player world position, and then the coordinates are exactly what you would uh, put in the re relative coordinates. You would put four, um, in the x coordinate and one in the z coordinate in order to get that position. Yes. And of course, we're not using the y here because we're assuming y always stays the same. That's the y is the up and down. Okay. Let's take a look. Oh, I should tell you that. When the game ends, I'm not going to make you sit here and watch me play it. I will tell you that as you go along, not only do you get faster because you're learning it, but as you get more and more of the blocks filled up, it becomes easier and easier to um, <laughs> break the block, to find the block. Um, okay, let's go look at the code. Now, I will tell you that this code was the most challenging that I've done so far. And it's because I started off with a really wrong idea. I thought that I might, would be, be able to just make this grid and then to see if a space was available in order to put the coordinates like here minus four one, because I wouldn't want to put a green one up there and I wouldn't want to put a red one up there because those I've already done. I need one that's available. So that would be these white ones. Well, in order to find a white one, how do I do that? I want it to be random. I thought I could just generate a random coordinate on this grid and then test for that position to see if it's a white um, stained glass block. Well, that worked and I did get the entire game to work as I wanted and it was so slow that I was afraid I was going to age a year playing one game. I mean, it was so slow. So I had another idea, which was how to use an array of true-false positions. Say so if it was available, um, it would be true and false if it weren't. And so I, then I kept track as I uh, used up blocks, I turned those to false in the array. Well, that was pretty good. It was actually easier to think about when I tried doing a two-dimensional array. And although I could get that to work, sort of, and I understood how to do it in JavaScript, but I actually never got the code to run properly, and I was a little uncomfortable that maybe in the blocks I couldn't do a two-dimensional array. I, the jury's still out. I need to write some a separate little program to just test to see if I can create and use a two-dimensional array. Maybe. I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay. So I went to the one-dimensional array of 100. So this block, this grid is 11 by 11. Well, since the endpoints are 5, 5, 5, minus 5, and here, minus 5, minus 5, and over here, what is that one? Okay, what is it? It's minus five, five. Okay, it look, why isn't there 10? Well, it's because we got a zero in the middle. 
So that means there are, it's an 11 by 11 grid, which is 121 spaces. So I made a one dimensional array of 121 spaces, and then I had to map these coordinates onto that single dimension array. And, and I had to go back and forth with that. And it turned out that it was pretty fast, but it was horrendously complicated because I had to transform those coordinates back and forth all the time. And I, I thought about explaining this to you and I thought, oh geez, I, ca I can't explain it. I can barely understand it myself. Uh, and by that time, the program had actually gone so big, gotten so big that I, it couldn't be represented in blocks. I could work with it in JavaScript, but I couldn't go back to blocks. And I thought, okay, what have I learned in my whole career? Well, I have learned that when the code starts getting that complicated, you better take an evening off, go to sleep, and wake up with a much better idea. And that is exactly what I did. And now I kick myself. Absolutely, for not thinking of this the first time because it's totally obvious. And I've even used this uh, idea in the past in some of the code that I've already published with you. So I'll stop railing on. What I ended up doing was may have a single dimension array of positions. And as a position got used up, I just took it out of the array. So when I generate, all I had to do to generate a new one was just gen pick something out of that single dimension array. Very, very simple and the code shrank, shrank, shrank. Okay, let's go back to the code. On start, um, all it does is initialize a few things. The block list is, is used to paint the coordinates that you're supposed to answer. And I use two different colors so that you can tell when a new one is coming up. Otherwise, it's hard to know if one of the coordinates is old or, or new. Then I have a flash list. Note, remember when I showed that it was um, XZ, which is the same as East South. So I use these to flash back and forth. and. I fiddled with the code to even, I have it set up so that I could repeat that as many times as I wanted, but since the print is so slow, I decided once was enough. Now I've started using these variables in my text statements because I, I can't see, look at this. It's really hard to tell which of these is empty and which is a space. To me, they both look the same, but they're not. So I actually started using these variables so that I know what I'm doing. Okay, the run chat command is where the action gets, uh, the action gets launched. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> the first thing it does when you hit run is it moves, moves east <clears throat> so that you have a, um, a clean slate to start with. Then it sets the origin. That's where the cyan block is going to be. It remembers the origin position, which is initially where the player is. I use that technique in most of my programs. Then I set a print position. Uh, the print position is where the coordinates get printed, and I need to keep track of that because it's, it was kind of tedious to figure out where exactly to print each thing. Um, and then I keep track of how many uh, a player got wrong because at the end of the game, I calculate the percentage wrong and show did I get 95%, 92%, or 10%? Oh my, okay. Then I run the chat command compass because I want to draw the north, south, east, and west. Well, and I do this as a chat command, not a function because doing the chat command, it'll go off and do it and keep on running these other things. If I had a function here, it would wait for it to complete. And because it's print commands, they're really, really slow. So I don't want to wait, I just want to go on. The next thing I do is I put the brackets. So the brackets surrounding the coordinates, I only need to put those up there once if I'm careful about where I print things. So I also run that as a chat command so I can go ahead and add the brackets, do the brackets while I'm doing other things. Then I draw the canvas. That's the stuff I'm putting on the ground. It's the grid. <coughs> and the grid has an underlayer. And I use that underlayer 
in the code, and I'll explain that later. When we start off here, the under layer is white, and the top layer is white. The under layer is white cement or concrete, and the top layer is white stained glass, except for the cyan position where the top layer is cyan glass and under the under layer is cyan concrete block. And then, um, so that's what Canvas does. It also adds those little you know, things that stick out to help you watch the, know where the axis is and so on. Then I call the position flat, <laughs> flash uh, XZES. So it flashes that to help you understand what the coordinates mean. And then I call the function initialize the available array, and I'm going to show you that in a minute. <clears throat> Once that is done, I call the function new coordinate, and that's what launches the game. From this point, the way the game works is it finds an available um, position that is a white block, white glass block. It puts that position, uh, that coordinate, it displays it up. Um, in the sky, and the user is supposed to break a glass at that point. And if it breaks it correctly, then there's an unbroken event that uh, figures out whether it's correct or not. And if it is, it puts a, a green, replaces it with a green block. And if it's not, it replaces it with a red block after flashing a few times a red block in the air to show you what the real coordinate was. And then it does the whole thing again. <laughs> so until you, there are no more blocks available. So let's look at how we initialize this array. So um, since the for loop runs from 0 to 10, I have to make this little ad adjustment. So I have an index x going from 0 to 10, but I use an available x, um, which is index minus 5. Do the same thing for z. And then an available position is, I, this is a world coordinate. So I just put the available x and the available z. So that's a coordinate on the grid. The, the position is simply like minus 5, minus 4. And it's not a world, it's not a position. Um, the actual position of in the Minecraft world would be different, but here I'm only keeping track of relative to origin. So this is the position really relative to origin. And then I store that available position in the array called available. And then I keep going until I have them all in there. Um, and then we, after it's initialized, we're going to go get a new coordinate, and that's when the coordinate gets painted on the screen. So here is how we get a new coordinate. We call the function get available. Okay, let's just go look at that. There is get available. It's really not complicated, it just looks a little busy. So first of all, we want to be sure the length of the array is greater than zero, because that would mean that if it's zero, there's none available. So in that case, if it's zero, what we do is we set available found to false and we get out. So then over here, it, it tests to see if available was found. And if there is none available, it goes down here to call print score, and that's the end of the game. But let's assume there is one available. And then it um, the available index, that's into the array of available positions, it picks random to zero to the length of the array. Then available position is it picks that place out of available at that random index and it removes, notice that remove value, it removes that position so that from now on it's not available because it's not in the available array. Then we calculate the, we get the available x, which is just that available position, get value of x. And of course, that can be minus 5 to 5 because it's relative to origin. That's what we put in there. 
and same with available z. And then we set available found true. That's all there is to it. You wouldn't believe how much code this simple routine replaced. And my knowledge went up a great deal. Okay. So if available is found, then the answer position, we want to be origin plus the available position. Origin is the center cyan block, and then we add this, so that makes it the coordinate in the Minecraft world, not just our little grid. And the answer x is the available x, which we had calculated before, and the answer z is, is available z. And then uh, what I do, all of this is about printing. And all of this is because if I have, if it's a negative, I have to print the neg negative sign, but instead if it's positive, I want to have a space there so that they line up perfectly. So that's what all this gobbledygook is about. And then um, this in prints uh, variable is what gets tested to see whether which of the two blocks is used. So I, every other time, obviously I'm using a mod, the print x and print z are used in a mod, are in a mod function. So I run print x and print z. Now note, this is very important. This speeded up the game by, it almost had, it greatly improved the speed of the game. So by running these as chat commands, that means they can pr print those coordinates basically at the same time, rather than wait for one to finish and then do the other one. And another thing that really helped is, I could have printed these all in one big print command, takes forever and it has to print the, all those spaces that's needed to space it out correctly so by doing it this way i only print the actual minimum amount and i don't repeat all the spaces that uh, are needed and i don't repeat the black brackets <clears throat> so this is what does that print now this number like four that came from futzing to figure out where it needed to start relative to the brackets. Here, print Z is starting at 18, um, saying it's, um, I, I figured that by just doing it again and again until I got it where I wanted. Okay, now, that means we got a new coordinate. Let's see, we got a new coordinate, and we printed it in the sky. Now, what happens then? Well, at that point, we wait for the user to, well, nothing happens until the user breaks a block. So those are on broken events. We go over here to the broken events. We have white, cyan, green, and red. And all of those are gonna do exactly the same thing, but I have to put them here like this uh, because um, That's the way it works, and I call the same function. Do the broken event. Now, this is interesting. The way this first worked, I'm not, I'm not even going to tell you, but it was very complicated. I, anyway, this is greatly simplified over what I, how I first had it. What I want to do, now remember, answer position was calculated back over there when I got the available coordinate. <clears throat> I'm going to test for error at the answer position. Because if the block was broken, there's air instead of one of those stained glass blocks. So I'm going to test for air. If it's air, then I'm going to do all this stuff right here. If it's not air, that means it's wrong. So I do this, and I'll explain that in a minute. Because, OK, so if the answer position uh, what had air in it, then I have to do one more thing before I fill it with green and I put an under block of green. I'm going to test to see if it's cyan underneath what was broken. See, I'm looking underneath what was the answer position. If it is cyan, I don't want to do anything because even if that block were correct, I never want to, I always want to keep it cyan because otherwise you're going to lose your anchor in terms of how to look at the grid. I've tried changing it to green and it was just frustrating. So at that point, I place green, the green glass on top and a green underlayer. 
And I'll explain later why I need the underlayer. If it was wrong, then I'm going to do repeat this five times. Basically, I'm flashing. And th notice these are one above the, the where the stained glass is. I flash red, then air, then red, then air, then red, then air. And this is to give the user time to look around the grid to see where that is, because that's the correct answer. That is the correct answer. Um, and then I place it, uh, this is just to make sure uh, it ended, the block got wiped out by putting air there. And then I place the red block at the answer position because you missed that one. And I place a red under layer, minus one here. And then I change I the wrong count by one. And then I run the chat command fill air. Well, what in the heck is that? Well, consider the fact that you got one wrong. Well, I don't even know where you hit it. Because when you break a block, there is no easy way to know which block was broken. I can test it against answer to see if it was the answer block because there's air there. See? But what if it what if uh you got one wrong where did you hit there's no way to know so it has air there but how do i fill that back in because i wanted to just go back to whatever was there before well um the way i do that is i have a chat command called fill air and what that does it's a chat command so it gets launched if you hit one wrong and what it does, it just, it just goes through and it does this kind of in the background because the program keeps on running doing its thing so you don't even know this is going on. But if you'll watch when it runs, if you, uh, if you have an empty one, pretty soon you'll see it fill up. So fill air, all it does is it goes through the entire grid. You know, i got a double loop here. And... Um, I look at a possible position, and if there's air there, then I fill it. But what do I fill it with? Well, it depends on what was there before. Well, what was there before? Well, what was there before, that's why I need the underlayer. I can tell by looking at the underlayer what was there before. And I fill it in, the glass in, uh, to match the underlayer. And that is all that that does. So after launching fill air, and fill air does one more thing. If you accidentally hit a block, um, even when um, maybe you hit two blocks simultaneously, it sometimes sort of happens. Well, fill air will actually catch those also, um, which is nice. Okay. Now, once you've run that chat command fill air, or launched it, you don't have to wait for it to finish, then whether you had a right or a wrong answer, you're going to call a new coordinate. And that starts the whole process over. You go back over here to new coordinate, and you get another available position, and then you go through that whole, and you then eventually print it in the sky, and then you wait for the user to break another block. That is all there is to it. So let's go look at, let's get one wrong. <laughs> okay, the right one is gonna be minus four, one. It's gonna be that one. What if I hit that one? See, it's flashing. No, that's the right one, that's the wrong one. I'm wondering if it shouldn't flash green instead of red. And notice how this block got filled in. Well, that was that um, fill air thing running. Okay, minus one, minus two. Let's do that one more time. So minus one would be here, minus two would be there. So let's get that one wrong. Notice the empty space. Okay, that's where it should be. And if I just wait here a minute, it's gonna find that empty space. Of course, it there it is, filled it in. Okay, and I could have gone ahead doing another one and um, in fact let's see if I can do that so now I have one five one 
five. So that's going to be that's going to be the correct one. Let's do that one instead. Okay, it's flashing. The next one is two zero. That one. See, I still got the empty block, so I can keep on doing something while fill air is working. See, it finally got it. Okay, that is coordinate game. Now this really does, so basically in Minecraft the coordinates are a little strange since they're, you know, east is x and south is z and it's a little hard to get the hang of. So this, and you, you need to really understand what these coordinates mean because in nearly everything you do you have to have a mental image of what is what you're trying to build and it's important that you understand just almost intuitively what how to specify these coordinates i hope this game really helps thank you this is grandma out